All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for giving us this beautiful day, Lord, even as we come together to study your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak. You will minister to our hearts, Lord, uh, that our hearts will be good ground uh, to receive what you have to speak to us today, God. We thank you. We submit this day into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last class, uh, we looked at chapter 16, right? Uh, we looked at the heart of a leader. And... Uh, we look at you know a few aspects of a leader number one was uh, a life of servanthood and uh, we look at the life of jesus so he did not have an inferiority complex nor did he have a superiority complex so uh, there was this place where he walked in humility but he also walked in authority right and and that's a balance that uh, eventually we will find when we step into leadership right uh, there'll be times when you know, we walk in humility, uh, but we also walk in authority, right? Uh, and, you know, as we develop this ability, we will learn how to, uh, I'm not saying that we all already know it, but, uh, you know, we, we will learn from our mistakes. We will learn, the Holy Spirit will guide us, teach us on how to live this life of servanthood, right? Uh, we looked at three temptations to avoid, to be self-sufficient, to be, you know, spectacular or to be powerful, thinking that, okay, look, I can do all things. I, I know the worst is there, but, uh, you know, not just saying, okay, it's my ability, my skills and my gifts, but to always trust in God, um, to be humble, avoid being celebrity mentality and, um, you know, basically also to be powerful in the sense that, you know, uh, taking control of, uh people or uh, taking control of the people that you're ministering to especially right so we must be as leaders we must be motivated in love keep a constant check on our hard attitudes why am i doing what i'm doing we looked about being totally committed being positive even during the ups and downs and how david uh, uh you know look at that example in second first samuel 30 where uh when he came back from his war he saw that the uh, enemies had come and taken his wives and children and uh, but it says that in uh first samuel 30 and verse 6 he says david encouraged himself on the lord he stayed positive so it's very important for us as believers and as leaders especially you know we get into this place of okay um there was there is going to be ups and downs there are going to be challenges but you continue to fix your eyes on jesus continue to uh, stay positive and know that um, every season that we're going through is ordained by God and God knows how to uh, handle us, right? Okay, let's get into chapter 17, developing the leader in you. Now, all of us, uh, you know, we, we have been given a leadership mentality, right? Uh, when we talk about leadership, we all have some kind of leadership skills in us, right? Uh, I just want to share this, right? Leadership, how does it come? One, leadership comes through hard work. Two, leadership can be given, just given to somebody. And three, leadership is inherited. And think of this. Leadership can come through hard work. You can have people who work hard and they become leaders. Then you have leaders who, leader, you know, People are just given leadership. They may not have worked hard for it. They may not have even thought of it, but they've just been given leadership. And three, leaders, um, you know, gain leadership through inheritance, maybe their parents or, uh, you know, it's just inherited to them. But how can you and I develop ourselves? Four important areas when it comes to leadership. And, you know, when you talk about leadership, it's a vast topic, right? Uh, there's so much, uh, you know, apart from influence, it's 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 a it's a vast topic when you talk about uh, leadership. But how can you and I? Right? Let's look at a few areas here. Four areas to grow in leadership. Number one, competence. 
right? Uh, when you when you think about competence, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? Knowledge. And, uh, if I want to be a leader in any aspect, right? Uh, I need to be knowledgeable. I cannot tell myself, okay, uh, God will make me a leader. So I just sit around and wait. It, it's not going to work. We must be competent. Right? We must have knowledge. Right? We must be able to understand and be able to learn and develop ourselves. Very, very important in leadership. Right? Now, when you talk about it in ministry, uh, so for example, you want to be a leader in the ministry. Right? Now, uh, even if it's just in a volunteering team, you must have the knowledge. Right? You and I must have the knowledge. We must be able to get into God's word, read God's word, understand how God works, understand about the principles of leadership, gain that understanding, apply it in our life, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and grow. That's what competence is. Competence is the aspect of you know, growing your skills, applying that skills in your life and in your in whatever area that God has called you for. And you know, uh, that will help us to develop as leaders, right? Uh, uh, next point under that is skill, right? So if I want to be a good leader, I need to develop skill. Uh, now, these skills can be people skills, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, your job skills, your talking skills, your listening skills, There's so much skills that we must learn, right? So what, what you can do as a leader, uh, uh, especially when it comes to competency, uh, skill is something that you have to keep pressing on and on and on. No matter what phase of leadership you are in, you may be a leader for 10 years, 15 years, it's all right. We, you know, we have to keep growing. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this saying, right? There's, there's no point, there's no... Uh, a, a leader who does not look at growth remains stagnant, and uh, you know his leadership skills just stop there. Look at the example of the great apostle Paul. What does he say? He's come towards the end of his life, right? Uh, and he's writing and he's saying, "Listen, I don't look back. I don't look at what I've done, what 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 you know, what churches we have planted, what ministry we've done, and what what." I don't look back. I'll press on forward to for the goal, for the things that God has for me. Right. Uh, so, so you and I, we look back and we look at our, uh, you know, the places where we have been, we have been successful. Look back. We look at places where we have failed, but we we don't have, we don't have to live in what what happened before. We live. What's going to happen further on? Okay, so you build your skills, you build your competence, and you keep growing. Experience. And when you talk about experience, it is something that comes out naturally, right? Uh, uh, you know, if you, for example, right, if you, if you are preaching the first, you know, first time you're going to be preaching or the first, you know, six months of preaching, it is natural to be nervous, to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, it's natural, right? Because it's, it's, you're just doing it new. It, it's new to you, right? But if you look at five years down the line, you will see yourself so much better. Why? Because when you started off, you were nervous. You didn't know how to how to speak, or we didn't know how to what example to give when to speak, what to speak. But over time, you have gained experience. Experience is something that cannot be bought. Experience is something that is naturally acquired. Right? Uh, and not only in ministry, in any area, any area of our lives. Right? Uh, experience is something that is that comes naturally. Look at this example, right? Now, if you if you aren't married and uh, you know you may not be very good with kids, you have no experience with kids. But the moment 
even somebody is married, they've had kids, their kids are grown up, uh, 10 year old. Now you know what, what experiences you've gone through it. You've sat up the whole night with fever, the kids with fever and stomach pain, you know, all these things that happen. You know how to, uh, you know, you've seen kids growing up, you've seen, okay, the tantrums and uh, you've seen the good things that they can learn. You know, you've experienced it. And so you when if somebody asks you, you know, uh, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to have a child. What is the first thing you'll say? You're not going to open a book and say, okay, let me tell you what to do. No, it's all inside. It's experience. You know, okay, hey, don't worry. Initial years is going to be a little... Um, difficult, but you know, you know, as the baby grows, as the child grows, and he's two years old, three years old, it's a beautiful time, you will enjoy it. It's just natural. Why? Let's come out of experience. And experience is something that we can always hold on to. Right? Uh, it helps us build our competence. Second Timothy 2:2. 2, 2, what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. Look at this. Paul is writing his last letter. He's writing to Timothy, who was a young boy that he met many years ago, about 17 years ago. Now, Timothy has grown up. He's in his early 30s, right? So Timothy has the experience. He has watched the Apostle Paul. He has watched his ministry. He's leading the church now, and he's saying, Paul is saying to him, Timothy, what you learn from me? What you have seen, the abilities, the knowledge, the experience, what do you have seen faithfully and trust to people that they will be able to teach others? So number one is confidence, not, sorry, competence. Grow in your competence, right? you know, whichever area you are in. Right? You could even be a life group leader, you could be a worship leader, you could be a volunteer leader, whatever area of leadership, keep looking to grow. Right? Number two, confidence. Confidence is, again, an aspect of our personal, uh, you know, uh, something that we are wired with, right? Now, for example, there are people who are low on confidence by nature, right? If you Normally, if you look at introverts, People who don't like to talk much. Uh, it's not like they're low on confidence. They just prefer not to talk much, very simple, right? And there are some of them who are very low in confidence. Now, confidence, uh, the reason could be maybe because when they were small, their teachers were, you know, rude to them or harsh on them. Maybe their parents were harsh on them, saying, you know, you are not good enough, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Or another reason could be they're they are shy to take up leadership. They, they don't believe in the skills that they have. Uh, but remember, when it comes to leadership, it is very important to develop confidence. Listen, Moses was not confident. He, was, he had zero confidence in himself. He said, no, God, I can't go. You're sending me to Egypt. You're telling me bring two million people out of Egypt now. Uh, I can't. I can't even talk. And he gave, you know the story, he gave a lot of excuses. Right? Uh, but thank God that, you know, God enabled him and he went. Confidence is something that can develop over time. Just because we are not confident doesn't mean God is not going to make us leaders. Right? Let me share this example. I have, in my personal life, I've never, right, from the time I was small, I never really went on stage. A complete introvert. I would never talk to people, never go on stage, never participated in uh, school programs, school skits, never. Even, as I said, you know, for my 10th standard marks card, I didn't want to go on stage to collect it. I, you know, I was so nervous. I just didn't want to go. I wanted the certificate, but I didn't want to go on stage. But, you know, my parents dragged me and said, you have to go. Uh, confidence is something that can develop. But I remember after I became a believer and I knew that, okay, if I want to become a leader, I cannot behave this way. I cannot tell myself, okay, you know, I can't just, you know, do what I'm doing. I Ministry is about people. So I must be able to talk to people. 
I must be able to build confidence in myself. And only then I can, you know, minister and give, bring confidence to others through the word of God. If I myself am not confident, how can I make others confident and make them, you know, help them to trust in God? So without, with no confidence, we can do very little. But here's the, here's the you know, interesting part, right? Here's the encouraging part that uh, God, through his spirit, gives us a spirit of boldness. Right? He gives us boldness. He gives us courage to step out, right? Confidence comes from positive experiences. And sometimes confidence comes through people. Right? Uh, it's easier to take small steps rather than big steps. Right? Uh, so look at small steps, meaning look at ways that you can build confidence in a small way. Right? One of the things that I did, uh, you know, uh, since I was an introvert and I became a believer, I knew that I had to build confidence. How do I do it? Right? You know, my comfort zone is me and my Bible or me and an instrument. That's why I don't need people around me. That's me. Right? Uh, I just don't need people around me. I can survive. I can thrive alone in a room with my Bible and a couple of I can thrive. I can really do well. But that's not what ministry is about. You leave me in a room for 48 hours, it's fine. I can be there alone. It's fine because that's how I was wired, but I had to step out of it. So I began to take small steps. What did I do? Some examples that I'll share, and you can probably apply it and try it in your life, right? I would write down sermons. This is, I think, 20, 2009, uh, 2009, yeah, 2009, early 2009. So I would write down sermons, and I would stand in front of the mirror, and I will preach the entire sermon, 45 minutes, uh, preach them. Uh, and I would act like there were people sitting in front of me and preach. And then I would probably take out the guitar or, uh, and sing a few songs, right? behave like, okay, there are people around. Over time, confidence came in. Confidence is built through positive faith in God. See difficulties as an opportunity to grow. Again, as a leader, uh, well, we need to, you know, be positive and trust God. Have faith in God, right? Knowing that God will give us these opportunities to grow. Confidence is built by believing the gifts that God has placed in you. Right? Sometimes God places gifts in us, and we can say, "Hey, I don't want. Uh, I, I, I don't know it. I don't want it. Uh, I don't want to use it." Right? No. You believe in the gifts that God has placed in you. Now, right now, you may feel that, hey, this is not, uh, you know, it's not something that I'm gifted in. I was never gifted to preach on stage, talk on stage. No, it was a big zero, right? It was not in me. To be about preaching and, you know, just going on stage. No, it was not. Right? But over time, right, you, you, the Holy Spirit, gives us these gifts inside of us, and he expects us to believe in that gift and believe that he is with us when we step out and begin to use those gifts. Right? So very important. Use the gifts that God has given. Be confident about it. it you may be just taking one small step. Maybe God has given you a gift for praying and intercession. But now you feel you can pray only 10 minutes. That's okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of it. Okay. Hey, God has given me a gift of uh, praying intercession, but I'm only praying 10 minutes. That's okay. It's just starting off. Build confidence in that gift. Okay, God, I know that you will you will help me. You will put a burden in me. You know, you read the book of Jeremiah. It's, it's so powerful. Right? The burden that God put in him. And the way God just, you know, just used him to speak to Jerusalem. He was there before, during, and after the fall of Jerusalem. The Babylonians came and overpowered them. 
Now, the way that God used him uh, was so powerful. Uh, see what you have rather than what you do not have. Don't focus on what we do not have. See what you have. You have five loaves of bread and two fish. Use it. I don't see what I don't have. It's easy to focus on what we don't have. But you can, you can say, God, thank you for what you've given me. Five loaves of bread, two fish. You take it, Lord. Even as I pray, you multiply it and let it be a blessing to thousands of people. Right? Confidence is built by encouraging or encouragement. Stay around people who can encourage you. Stay around people who can encourage, exhort, correct you at times, correct in love. That correction is only because they want to see you get better. Stay with people who are encouraging. Encourage you. Hey, go ahead. Don't worry. Uh, uh, and I thank God that at a young age I, I became a believer. I thank God for leaders and people who are around who always encourage me. I can tell you the number of mistakes I've made. So many. But the encouragement, the push. No, go ahead. Continue. You can do it. Right? And, and really got me through. Right? Imagine, you know, you're just trying to step out trying to do something and you have some leader say, you know, what did you do? Why did you mess up this way? What's going to happen? It's just going to bring us down. Uh, but be around people who can encourage you, who look at you as leaders and can build you up, right? So the first one was competence. Second one was confidence. Third one is compassion. The Lord Jesus, uh, when he ministered, he ministered with compassion. There was no place where Jesus was, you know, ministering without compassion. That was the basis of his ministry, compassion. Wherever he went, when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion on them. When the, when the leper came running to him, oh, if you're willing, you will heal me. Jesus had compassion. He said, I am willing. When he saw the sick, when he saw the, the blind, the, the uh, those who were, uh, you know, fury and weak, and Jesus says, you know, these are like sheep that are gone astray. It's called compassion. A very important attribute of a leader is to have compassion, right? Compassion, uh, uh, without compassion, ministry to people becomes a burden. Look at that. Without compassion, Ministry to people becomes a burden. So if people come up to you and say, hey, uh, you know, I've got uh, a headache, I've got back pain, I've got leg pain. Uh, if you don't have compassion for them, what's going to happen? It'll become a burden. Oh, again, they are coming, again, the same prayer point. Be compassionate because we don't know what they're going through. You know, we can say, hey, why don't you just, you know, eat well, exercise and sleep? We don't know what they're going through. Right? They may be in pain. Maybe their soul is in pain. And that's reflecting on their body. Right? So let our ministry be driven by compassion. Have a burden for people. Right? Now, when you have a burden for people, people will not become a burden to you. Right? Jesus, whatever he did, was motivated by compassion. He loved us. He loved the people that he saw. You may ask, what about the high priests and what about the Pharisees and the Pharisees? Everyone. He loved everyone. They didn't love him. They didn't care about him. He loved them. How do we know? On the cross itself, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's talking to the Romans. He's talking to the high priests. And, uh, Everyone there, say, Father, forgive all these people. They don't know what they're doing. See, ministry must be based out of compassion, out of the love of Jesus Christ. And that is where people will notice, people will realize. Love is something that is always seen outwardly. It's, it's seen. You can see it in our face. You can see it with, uh, in our actions. 
Jesus just didn't say, uh, you know, John 3.16 doesn't say God so loved the world. And there's no full stop there. We all know God loves the world, but what did he do about it? That he gave his only begotten son. When you and I walk in love, walk in compassion, we will give. We'll come to this place of giving. Come to this place of doing ministry out of love. It'll not be a burden at all. Okay, number four, fourth point, collaboration. Uh, as leaders, we must develop the ability to collaborate. That means to work together with others, right? Uh, so some of the things that we do here at APC, let me just share. I've shared it before, uh, but for one conference, media team, first administration, administration team, accounts team, media team, graphics team, the uh, ministry leader team, the pastors involved in that conference. Uh, all these teams work together. As leaders, we must develop the ability of collaborating and working together. Nothing that we can do in any of our conferences can be done by one team. It cannot be done. Even if it's an event, it cannot be done. And so as leaders, develop that ability to work with others. Right? You need to be able to sit, discuss, plan, and you know, make sure that whatever you're doing is done together as a team that will make it successful. Uh, because sometimes when leadership comes, you know, we, we don't want to listen to others. Come to this place of, hey, I'm 10 years, 15, 20 years in ministry. So you don't tell me what to do, you listen to me. That's wrong. Because if we want to be effective leaders, we must be also willing to collaborate and work together. That's a that's a skill. That's a that's something that God expects of us. But look at Jesus. He could have done everything on his own. Right? But no, he chose 12 people, he collaborated with them. And I'm sure, you know, if you think of it, the Bible says that he made Judas the money keeper. So he was in charge of all the money. So if Jesus wanted to go somewhere, I'm sure he would have checked with uh, Judas. Judas, how much money do we have? Can we go into Samaria? Uh, how long can we stay there? Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, so Peter, how do we get to Samaria? Should we go this way? Do you think Jesus didn't know how to do it? He knew how to do everything on his own. But I'm sure he collaborated with his disciples. He got them involved. Right, and uh, and when we do that, you know, it just it just builds us as leaders, right? God places God places people in your life strategically. You must establish a connection so that you can give into them, and they can give into you. Very important. God places people in your life strategically. Now, when God places people in your life, there are times when they are just for seasons. And there are times they could be there for just for just a very short season, or it could be for a couple of years, or it could be for a long time. Right. So when God places people, establish that connection, work together. What is the perfect example we can use? I think the perfect example in scriptures is that of Paul and Barnabas. Paul is 14 years away. Nobody's heard of Saul. Uh, is he? He's making tents in Tarsus. Nobody's heard of him. The same guy who has seen Jesus, who was on the road to Damascus. He's seen Jesus. He's heard the voice of Jesus. Right? Three years he was in Arabia. Now 14 years he's gone missing. Nobody knows about him. But God, in his wisdom, very strategically, spoke to Barnabas and said, Barnabas, when you go to Antioch, first go look for Saul of Tarsus, bring him and come to Antioch. 
strategic The minister together. Can you hear me okay? I think uh, my network is the network okay? Yeah. Okay. Everyone can hear me okay? So make sure. You had disappeared for a minute, but now you're back, sir. I'm back? Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So so look at uh, Saul, uh, Saul of Tarsus. So what did God do? He brought the right person just for that first missionary journey. He probably was with Paul for maybe about six months, six to seven months. Right? So they go, they go on their first missionary journey, come back, there's a disagreement. After that, we don't hear anything about Barnabas, but we know all that Paul did. Only towards the end, Paul writes and he says, bring Barnabas to me. Oh, sorry, bring uh, John Mark, he says, with you know, Barnabas and John Mark. But until the end, we don't see anything about Barnabas. God strategically brings people into our life to help us become effective leaders they speak into your life you speak into their life right uh, think about people god has placed in your life as a potential source of encouragement support and strength uh, right it's not like one person can fulfill all everything in your life right you must be connected with many people Yes, there will be leaders in your life. As a leader, as a believer, you may have lead, one leader, but you got to you know, be able to also receive from others. Now, again, when I say this, it's uh, we must also understand that there's a divine order in that. I, so we must not go beyond the order that God has given us. We connect with people. And, uh, um, you know, different leaders within the church, within the ministry. You connect with them, right? Uh, you can learn from volunteers as a leader. Right? I remember this a long time back. Uh, I think it was 2010. Uh, I used to come to church, and there used to be this young couple. And they would, you know, the mother would carry the child and arrange the chairs. I remember that very clearly. And I was, you know, oh, I used to watch that and say, wow, look at that commitment. Person, she's holding a baby, probably one year old baby, and putting the chairs, doing ushering in the church. That calls for commitment. Do you think we can learn something from that? You know, it's very easy for us leaders to say, you know, for to expect others to learn from us. Uh, but there are things that God can make us learn from even the smallest things that others are doing. Right? God may have something for you to give them and you need to connect with them. And sometimes God may have things that he wants you to learn and he can speak to somebody else. Remember, God spoke through a donkey. He can speak through anyone. Right? So these are the four uh ways that we develop ourselves as leaders number one competence number two confidence compassion and collaboration and there's much more uh but let's look at five levels of leadership right. any questions any thoughts okay five levels of leadership taken from uh uh the book million leaders mandate for, written by john maxwell uh the five levels of leadership five p's right number one position people follow you because they have to as a leader people follow you because they see something in you and they do it right? they obey the rules why did people follow moses of course they didn't follow him every time they wanted to stone him at one point but why did they why did they follow why did why did they come out of Egypt? Because there was a leadership position that was already bestowed upon him. God had already told Moses, I'm going to choose you to bring the people out of Egypt. And position, people follow because they have to. Two, 
permission. People follow you because they want to. Now you see the difference there. People follow you because they want to. What is the best example here we can use? Remember David? David is running from Saul. He's, he's afraid of his life, anointed as king. You know, yesterday I was reading a passage in uh, 1 Samuel, Samuel, Samuel 21. A very interesting passage. David is running away from Saul. And he, in 1 Samuel 21, I think it was 10, he goes into Gath. But the king Ashkish is there. And when he enters there, they recognize David. Aren't you the one who killed Goliath? And they sang, you know, David killed thousands and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Saul killed thousands, David killed 10,000. Aren't you the one? Aren't you the one who, uh, uh, you know, who's anointed as the king of Israel? And now David, at that time, when he realized that if he says yes, and if they recognize him, they're going to stop him there and they're going to, capture him, put him into prison, or maybe even kill him. And the Bible says that, you know, I may be digressing, but I, I, there's a point that I want to bring up. The uh, Bible says that he acted mad. He acted insane. He started scratching the walls. His spit started dripping from his mouth. He acted insane. And then the king said, oh, why did you bring him here? Why did you bring a madman in my presence? Let him go, tell him never to come back again. And he runs away from there. That's when he writes Psalms 34. He goes back into the caves. He, runs, he writes Psalms 20, 34, one of the most brilliant Psalms, Psalms 34, right? and how the Lord just delivered him. Listen, after that, what happens is 400 odd soldiers come to Saul, sorry, come to David and say, we will follow you. Whatever you say, we will do. Those 400 odd soldiers came because they believed in David. They saw the leadership skill in him. So there are times when God can take you through seasons, bring you into a place of position of leadership, and then you will see people following you. They'll follow you because they want to. You may be wondering why are these people, are, and I, I don't know much, I'm still learning. You may be wondering that, but they're following you because God has sent them to you. And, and the permission is given, meaning you give them the permission. You say, okay, if you want to follow, I'm following. David did that. Three is production. People follow you because of what you've done for the organization. You think this happened in, you know, Moses, Joshua's life? Moses, and you, you see the transition, Joshua gets into the leadership. Joshua says, 24-15, Joshua 24 15, you, you choose this day whom you're going to serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What did they say? They, they said, no, we'll do what you say. Why do you want, you know, whatever you say, whatever Joshua you say, we will follow you. Because we have seen, why? Because we have seen the hand of God. We have seen how God delivered us from, from the enemies. We have seen the mighty hand of God in every area of Moses' life, we see we will see the hand of God in your life as well. People have seen what you have done in your ministry or in your organization, and they will follow you. Four, people development. People follow you because of what you've done for them. Personal, what you have done for them, what you have spoken into their lives. Uh, uh, the sacrifices that you have made. Uh, when you look at the Apostle Paul and the people that he's ministered to, uh, Paul, Timothy, Silas, they didn't run away from, oh, it's better to, you know, Paul is a troublemaker. Wherever he goes, he starts preaching, and then in the end, everyone are getting upset, and they want to beat him up. And then now, because we are with them, we get beaten up, and we all get thrown into prison. So let me just... You know, just try and give an excuse and move away from him. No, that didn't happen. They knew. Imagine this, Timothy is in his early 20s. Why would he put his life in danger being with Apostle Paul? 
Why should I go through all of this struggle? He is doing it because he got a vision from God. Why should I go through, put my life in danger? I'm only in my early 20s. Why should I get beaten up, put into prison? Very easy to think it could that way. Right? But what did, what did Timothy do? He said, no. He held on to Paul. He said, no, I, 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 Paul, you chose me. And I was 17. You chose me, you showed me, you spoke into my life, and you have changed me. You have showed me. I knew the law. I was, I was behind the law, but you showed me what is grace, what it what it means to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. You showed me miracles. You you showed me the grace of God. You showed me, uh, you know, how to live and how to trust God. You showed me how to destroy the works of the devil. You showed me everything, so I cannot let go. I want to hold on. I'll stay with you. I'll trust you. What an amazing, you know, picture that would have been. People follow you because of what you have done for them. Thirdly, fifthly, fifth one, person what people follow you because of who you are and what you represent. What a powerful. That would be one of the most powerful level of leadership. People follow you because of who you are and what you represent. Paul says, follow me, just as imitate me, just as I imitate Christ. Who you are and what you represent. When you are totally committed to the things of God, and you're, to, you're passionate, you're walking in power, you're walking in anointing, you're, you're, you're serving God with a servant heart, a servant heart. You're doing what God has called you to do. People will follow you because of who you are, because of your sacrifices, and for who you represent. And say, hey, this person, as a leader, he represents Jesus. So let's follow him. Right? Moving up the steps of leadership, the higher you go, the longer it takes. The higher you go, the higher the level of commitment. You know, sometimes we got it backwards. We think, okay, the higher you go, the more relaxed life is going to be. And if you look at even in the corporate world, you know, the higher you go, there are perks, there are benefits, but the commitment needs to be much, much more. Right? The higher you go, the easier it is to lead. That's true. That's true. Look at uh, the Apostle Peter. He was trying to lead. He was you know, leading this small group, probably of believers, and uh, you know, just new to all of this. He's a fisherman. He doesn't know anything about leadership. He had to go, he had to learn, and then there were about 10,000 people who uh, pledged allegiance to Jesus in the first sermon. Now he's got a big church ahead, uh, you know, just looking to him. The higher you go, over the years, I'm sure he God just raised him up, raised him up, and when he came to this position, and he said, no, nothing matters. What matters is God. What matters is his work in my life. And it's just easier to lead. Right? The higher you go, the greater the growth. Uh, in, in ministry, the more, the higher you grow the things of God, the higher you grow in your leadership, yeah, the, the better you become as a leader, the greater is the growth that God gives us. You're, you'll never leave the base level or the levels below where you are. Meaning, the higher you grow, don't forget about the base levels. Right? Uh, remember that you were once there. You know, God will give these areas of, you know, he, he enable us to come to this positions of leadership. But as we grow in that positions of leadership, don't forget to take people along with you. And don't forget your base level leaders, right? Give them opportunities. Take them along with you. A leader is not somebody who just goes up and starts dictating things to others. But a leader is somebody who takes people from the base level, goes up, encourages them to, uh, to join along with them, right? 
as a leader you won't be on the level with all your people yeah remember that right so there are some people who don't want to become leaders there are some people who are happy being where where they are they don't want to take too much of effort they just want to relax do things in life remember there are when god has called you to a place of leadership there will be people who will be down Right. Meaning they'll, they'll, it's not it's not a, it's not God's fault. It's their fault. They don't want to become leader. They don't want to grow in the things of God. So as a leader, understand that there will be people who don't want to grow. They don't want to come up. Yeah. And you must also understand that your level of leadership just needs to increase. Right. So sometimes it won't be at the level of the others. and the crow look at an eagle 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 can fly a crow can fly eagle can fly above the storms but a crow cannot both can fly both have the wings both, both can fly but when you get into this leadership role where, and you go higher and higher higher you, as an eagle you don't want to always come down and you know to that level no right so of course we're not putting the others down we're saying god is raising you up as a leader and you there are greater positions that god is bringing you to not everyone wants that so we, we must you know stay assured in our heart there are people who want to learn there are people who don't want to learn as a leader i want to grow finally you must work to carry other leaders with you up the steps so you you carry leaders along with you. you you give them opportunities give them resources you may have to be able to uh you know spend time with them and even as we do this we will be able to you know grow as leaders and here's the here's the most you know interesting part uh you know as leaders god gives us the time he knows our weaknesses he knows our challenges he knows our strengths as well right and when we are yielded to the work of the holy spirit when we trust in his holy spirit he begins to minister to us so he guides us step. he leads us proverb says the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord so god is ordering our steps he may take us through these seasons he may orchestrate some impossible situations in our life but we can continue to trust god and say god i know that out of this will come something that you want us to be better leaders people who are completely committed to god right so we'll stop here next class we'll pick up from chapter 18 developing the ability to minister the word and in the spirit Thank you so much for joining this class. Uh, have a great day ahead and I'll see you on Friday. God bless.